All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to today's learning community for family leaders. My name is Melissa Pearson, and I am a project coordinator with Fredla. We're extremely happy you all have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to join us for this call. And we hope that you find it informative and useful in the work that you are doing with children, youth, and young adults with behavioral health needs and their families. The title of today's call is Understanding Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression, Addressing the Needs of Youth Who Are Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Questioning, Intersex, or Two-Spirited. Fredla wants to thank the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, as well as the National Technical Assistance Network, for funding the learning community and for supporting Fredla, a core partner in the TA network, to support this important peer-led learning process. The views expressed in this presentation and by speakers and moderators do not necessarily re reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the Un United States government. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we will have time for question and answer um, directly with our presenters. Um, but feel free if something comes up, if you have a thought um, that you would like to share, feel free to use the chat box um, during the presentation for that. I'm so excited to be able to kick off today's call by introducing you to one of the premier family leaders in the family movement, Barbara Huff. As many of you know, but for those of you who do not, Barbara is the founder and former executive director of the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Barbara has graciously agreed to serve as our guest facilitator today and will share with you a bit of history about how families have been involved in this work from the early days. So without further ado, I give you Barbara Huff. Thank you, Melissa. I am so excited to be here today. I see some familiar names, and um, it takes me way back. Um, I also want to thank Fredla and Jane Walker um, for inviting me to facilitate today's presentation. Um, when Jane asked me to take this opportunity today, be, and, we, and she asked me because we both realized that this has been a priority issue for family organizations for many years. And, um, she asked me to just give a little tiny brief history today to kind of kick things off, and so I wanted to do that for you. Um, when Jane and I were talking about that history, because she dates as far back in this as I do, uh, we both had this strong recollection about a time when the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health compiled some articles for our first ever newsletter focused on youth with mental health issues. Uh, this was back in 2001. And one of the articles for that youth-focused newsletter was a three-page piece written by Richard Donner, who is a friend of mine, and he happens to be gay. He was also my daughter's therapist for many years. Uh, the article was titled Beyond Tolerance, Reaching Out to Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender, Transgender Youth. And due to the subject matter of that article, no one would agree to help us fund that newsletter. As you might expect, the Federation back then, uh, we were a rather tenacious bunch. We printed it anyway. And we did it with our own discretionary money. And we got a lot of flack for it. And I, I just tell you that because um, that's been about 16 or 17 years ago now. And today, family organizations across the country <clears throat> are working to provide more information and support uh, to youth who are LGBT. I, to spirit and their families. Uh, I don't, this um, webinar probably wouldn't have taken place 17 years ago, but I'm sure glad it's taking place today. And with that said, we're delighted to have with us two people who have generously offered their time to share their knowledge and expertise with us today. Um, and thank you for moving that slide. <laughs> the first one I'd like to introduce <laughs> is Kathy Lazier. And Kathy is a longtime friend of mine. And I'm thrilled that she's a part of this today because um, she is um, tremendously knowledgeable in this field. Um, Kathy is a, is a faculty member at the University of South Florida and the co-director of the Cultural and Linguistic Competence Hub of the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health. 
that's a lot to say in one breath. Uh, Kathy is a facilitator for SAMHSA Center for Mental Health Services National Work Group to address the needs of children and youth who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, intersex, and two-spirit. So, Kathy, we welcome you. And her Thank partner you. today in this uh, presentation is Peter Gamash. Um, and he is the president of Turnaround Achievement, a consulting and evaluation group and is a consultant through the University of South Florida for the Technical Assistance Network also. Peter provides technical assistance to communities across the country focused on building systems of care and on LGBTQ issues. He is also a member of the National Work Group to address the needs of children and youth who are LGBTQ, intersex, and two-spirit and their families. Welcome, Kathy and Peter, and thank you for being willing to spend some time with us this afternoon regarding this very important issue. Thank, thank you. you, Barbara. And I'm going to um, just I want to thank Melissa and Barbara um, for the invitation to present today, and also just uh, wanted to thank all of the family organizations that have been at the forefront of a lot of this work. Um, a lot of the work that we do to address some of the needs of uh, the youth that often their needs that don't get addressed are only um, are only getting addressed because of the work of the family organization. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, we do have a, a quite a lot of um, information that we want to uh, present to you today and share with you today. So without uh, any further ado, I just want to. Uh, let you know what the major goal of today is, is that you really have a better understanding of who these youth and young adults are who identify um, as sexually or gender diverse. And we often use the term SOGI, and it's a little bit of a less, less of a mouthful. And also what's happened, as you can imagine, with the, um, and Peter's going to talk a little bit about this in terms of terminology and the labels, but um, it really does help us, I think, to talk about this population um, in a way that, one, that shortens the, the, the amount of time we talked about, but also uh, really talks about what it is we're talking about, which is gender identity and gender expression. So we're going to do a little bit of terminology in the beginning. We're going to talk very briefly about some of the um, historical trends. We'll also explore some of these major issues that are faced by individuals and their families. Um, we're going to talk about how a child and family service system can address their needs. Um, and while this is only an overview, we're also going to look at some of the American you know, social attitudes regarding care and treatment of persons who are LGBTQ. Uh, we'll also review some of the data about the disparities in behavioral health care uh, and also uh, look at data demonstrating why we need to have this specific focus and why it's necessary. Um, let me go ahead and... We're going to explore some of the complexities around about coming out, which is another term that we'll talk a little bit about. And we'll look at asset-based, affirming, uh, trauma-informed approaches to addressing the needs of LGBTQ youth uh, in therapeutic work and care planning, um, which many of you and your organizations are involved in. Uh, we'll explore some of the issues around intersectionality um, and also some of the cultural dynamics you know, of those individuals who are also members of other minority populations, such as racial or ethnic minorities. Uh, and lastly, we're going to leave you with a, a few of the resources. And actually, throughout this presentation, we'll be talking about some of the resources that are out there for you. So I want to just begin with a, a poll, quick poll question. Um, and that is, how many of you know someone who identifies as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, or or identifies as any, um, any, anybody that is around, you know, has a different sexual orientation or considers themselves gender diverse or on the gender spectrum. So if you could just go ahead and um, click on that poll.
Okay, the poll is closed. So I just uh, it looks like a hundred percent or forty one um, people or a hundred percent of people know somebody. Um, at first, there was somebody who was unsure, but uh, changed it to yes. So you know, I think that's that's one of the reasons that we're doing this. And one of the things that Barbara had said earlier was we should she didn't know if this could happen, you know, a number of years ago. Um, but the fact is that more and more people know somebody or they themselves are out. Um, so it's more important that we talk about this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Peter, who's going to talk a little bit about who are um, the people that we're talking about, and then talk about some of the terminology and, change, and, and some of the changes. And I, I want to just um, thank Peter again, because there are Providing terminology and labels around this particular issue can sometimes be a bit of a, um, a, a hot topic or controversial topic because terminology changes. Um, people respond to terminology and labels differently, uh, and they will either reject some of them or embrace it. But in terms of being able to have a common, um, you know, being in a common platform and talk about it, uh, we're going to provide you with some of the terminology that's out there now. So, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, provide a macro level view of the um, how this population is quantified, because I think that it's it's definitely helpful for us to get a sense of, you know, what what is the scope and the depth of of, of the population that we're speaking about. Um, so large scale nationally representative uh, population based surveys have found that approximately 3.5 percent of U.S. adults identify as LGB and 0.3% identify as transgender. And that there's an estimated, research studies have shown that there's an estimated more than 2 million children, youth, and young adults ages 10 to 24 who identify as part of this population. So this is a substantial number of uh, youth that are affected uh, across our, our country. And there have also been US census studies. Um, 2010 uh, decennial US census found that same-sex couples live in every state and in 93% of all counties. So there is broad national representation of people who are, uh, they identify as same-sex couples uh, living across the United States. And 21% of those same-sex couples are interracial or interethnic. So we have diversity within this population as well. And there are approximately 2 million children who live with uh, parents who identify with this population. So there's definitely a, a, a timely, uh, you know, and related issues in terms of uh, visibility around this population, but there's also a depth of impact on related considerations in terms of this being a very large uh, minority population that is uh, intersecting with other uh, minority populations. So there's definitely a lot of intersectionalities that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. There are also more than one million gay and lesbian veterans. So this, these are different ways to look at this population in terms of uh, people who are adults, as well as uh, transition age youth, as well as the their representation in different uh, spheres across the United States. So let's move to the next one. When we talk about this population, well, sometimes we'll see the different uh, big acronyms, right? <laughs> so it's LGBT is a very common one, it's DLBT, which is uh, more of a traditional um, one that has, has definitely um, been updated to LGBT. There's LGB, there's LGBTQ, right? So sometimes I have friends and colleagues who will say, okay, is it, <laughs> what is the full acronym again? Because they're really not sure. Um, LGBT, you know, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Um, so sometimes these long acronyms can, um, you know, get uh, a little bit much, but uh, they're very important because they're inclusive, right? They show the, uh, ex the, the extent of diversity within this community. And so in terms of running through some specific definitions, we have the LGBT, right, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, with definitions and terms that are presented here uh, in terms of, you know, ways that we describe this population. And then on the right side, we have the symbols that are associated with these, um, these specific groups. So you may see them on shirts and hats and stores or you know, different places all across the United States. And then the other part of the acronym, the LGBTQI2S, Q stands for questioning. 
and then the I is intersex, and the 2S is two-spirit. And so this is the, the uh, approach that SAMHSA uses, uh, the expanded acronym that is inclusive and has uh, uh, two-spirit for cultural uh, inclusion for Native American um, populations and uh, others that are um, part of this um, population of allies that are working to help one another across the spectrum of LGBTQI2S. And then SOGI, as, as Kathy mentioned earlier, is another term that you'll, you may see. It's uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. So that may be a, a catch-all term or a, a, a sort of descriptive categorical term for this population. Uh, and the specific definitions are provided here. Sexual orientation is a person's core, really, a core sense of the gender of people um, toward whom they feel romantic and or sexual attraction. Gender identity is a person's internal, emotional, and or spiritual sense of their own gender, and it may not be visible to others. So there are distinctive um, experiences that um, populations that are within this, uh, this group will experience. So this is the um, sense of the diversity um, that we have um, across this population. And another term is coming out. So the one common experience uh, across people who are uh, across the LGBTQI2S spectrum, as well as uh, the term SOGI, um, is the experience of coming out. And so this is a, uh, it is a form of, uh, of repression, and it is also um, interacts with oppression depending on uh, welcoming or rejecting environments that people are in at the time. They may not want to, for example, come out or express themselves or self-identify as part of this population as uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning intersex or two-spirit, for example. They may not um, want to disclose that, right, if they feel in, like they're in an unsafe environment. So coming out is a process. Um, that is common across this uh, spectrum of um, people's uh, experiences. And then you know, w when we talk about different terms, different definitions and approaches and ways that um, this population is described or specifically identified, specific, particularly in policy development, uh, we find this. There are lots of different acronyms and terms and definitions, so people will naturally ask, okay, what? Why are all these different? Well, because there's so much ongoing dialogue. This is this evolving um, discussions around what does it mean to to have a, a different gender identity or expression, for example, in our in this current context in our society. What does it mean to be an LGBT person, right, in a certain environment? So there's ongoing dialogue among different groups uh, of people and. So there are policy organizations, for example. There are advocacy organizations. Local communities have their own discussions around what these terms mean. National work groups get together and uh, do their best to have um, sort of structured uh, policy implication uh, definitions. There are professional societies, uh, medical societies, for example, as well as individuals. And everyone, there can be um, definitely different uh, uh, expressions uh, of uh, the, what these different organizations and individuals would consider the best descriptions, right? So there, there can be disagreements and, you know, there's lots of evolving um, dialogue around this and it's all very constructive. <clears throat> and so there are different reasons for why there are uh, different definitions that you may see. And one thing, consideration we hear is that, well, you know, if, if the, that service providers are sometimes struggling with um, not saying the wrong thing, right, to specific population groups. They don't want to offend them or they don't want to, you know, say the wrong thing, um, you know, for the sake of uh, trying to um, be conscientious of people's needs. And so knowledge is knowing what to say and wisdom is knowing whether or not to say it. So, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's just asking people how they would like to be identified is, is typically the approach. It's respectful. Uh, way to understand um, you know, gender and um, sexual orientation, for example. And, and mistakes can sometimes be made, right, in terms of uh, assumptions that can happen uh, with labeling or identifying people. Um, but this is an evolving um, learning process for everyone. And with this population, there is no one look or type. 
Just as there is no one look or type of person, there is no one look or type of family. And so we see a very broad diversity of families um, across the LGBTQI2S spectrum. Um, for example, to, uh, to uh, men with a child, to women with, uh, with a child, there may be a surrogate arrangement between a man and a woman. There can be single parents, right? And there's all kinds of different pairing um, that can happen with, with families. So the evolution of how we understand families has certainly changed from traditional perspectives um, of a nuclear family of, you know, many decades uh, ago. And so there are, there's an evolving understanding uh, in society of that there are many different types of families that are all contributing um, to society. And so we always say, um, you know, we can talk about data all day long, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's all about families, it's about families, it's about families, right? So the best way we can humanize and have people understand the needs of these populations uh, is to really focus on their, fa on their families. And th this, is the, um, this is why uh, we will continue in this uh, country to have an evolution uh, of understanding. So there are definitely historical landmarks uh, in the movement. Um, this is a, a sample timeline with many different uh, policy initiatives and legal um, evolution of uh, acceptance and inclusion uh, of this population. Um, so that is available uh, there. And I'll hand it back to Kathy for the research challenges and needs. OK, great. Thanks, Peter. So you know, um, just talking a little bit about that timeline, you know, we know that there are societal attitudes about LGBTQ people in America. And it's a long and complex history. Um, and so, you know, some of the more important things to remember in those timelines, though, is that in, back in 1952, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual published by the American Psychiatric Association listed what they termed homosexuality as a mental illness. But that was formally removed by the um, American Psychiatric Association in 1973. So since 1973, um, it has been removed. And, you know, what you see happening uh, currently, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the um, legal issues, but you know what you see in the 90s and, and this, um, you know, the later years has also been a myriad of court rulings um, on gays serving in the military, legalizing same-sex marriage and gay parent adoptions. And I think what Peter said is, you know, if we really need to focus on the family and what's really happening um, in our families and how do we do, um, how do we serve our families better that have children or youth or young adults or, or who they themselves as parents um, may identify as LGBT. Um, so some of the challenges that we've really seen, you know, uh, in, when you look at those historical milestones of the movement, it's sometimes difficult to separate the political from sort of the societal um, and from the kinds of services that we want to be able to provide. Um, and so what happens sometimes is we may have some limited federal research funds or the kind of funds that we get may change depending on um, the support that it's getting. And there may also be different ways of presenting material or not presenting um, findings that are out there. So you know, we know that um, we, so what we're trying to present to you is what the existing research does now. Um, we're going to present several findings from various research studies looking at the conditions, experiences, um, service experiences of sexual and gender diverse youth. And in truth, though, there's been very little research that has explored the interaction between behavioral health care and youth and young adults who are LGBTQ. And there's a number of um, um, grants and centers out there that are looking at what they call best practices or effective practices now. Um, so that's a, a really good thing. At the current time, um, it's difficult to identify uh, evidence-based practices. Um, even evidence-based practices you know, is limited because we don't often collect data about sexual orientation and gender identity. And this is something we'll be talking about um, later on as well. So if we're going to effectively meet the needs of LGBTQ youth, young adults and their families, you know, we definitely need more research um, to identify what some of those most uh, effective strategies are. Um, so if we think carefully um, about, 
uh, the statement, you know, all people are male or female and act that way, attracted only to the opposite sex. Okay. This is a value which may be attributed to what we call heterosexism, and it really dominates the American culture. Um, and so if someone experiences a challenge to that widespread belief, most don't even think twice about it. So, uh, you know, as a result, heterosexism is sometimes subtle. It's a very pervasive value that affects all cultural institutions in our society, sometimes in ways that are even hard to recognize. Um, and, you know, an example is when a youth is coming into care or you're trying to, um, you know, uh, build trust with a youth, you may start a conversation by asking, you know, a young girl, you know, do you have a boyfriend? Or you might ask, you know, the boy, you know, do you have a girlfriend? And, and instead, we're saying, um, is there, you know, the question you might ask, is there anybody that you're romantically involved with instead of just assuming um, that the person is heterosexual? So, um, you know, a few other examples, simple, simple things like showing um, affection in public without fear of violence or harassment, uh, children's books only reflecting heterosexual parenting, um, not being able to find, you know, uh, uh, find homosexual or what they term homosexual wedding cards. Um, so heterosexism can be subtle and, and overt. Um, and what happens is when a person identifies them as standing outside that cultural value, for example, a transgender youth, um, they are much more sensitized to and may be negatively affected by this dominant cultural value. So possibly even internalizing some of the negativity into their own view of themselves. Um, and people who are close to the individual who stands outside that cultural value often find themselves torn between sort of loyalty to their loved ones and to their family um, and loyalty to a culture you know, that they're a part of. Um, Peter, do you want to talk a, a minute about the rejection versus support? Sure, yeah. There, there are many different ranges of, um, of rejection versus support, and, and this provides at scale a way that you can kind of check in with uh, where people are at, basically, or even where, where you may be uh, looking at uh, kind of where things are, are uh, centered. So Dorothy Riddle created a wonderful scale um, that basically looks at the rejection versus acceptance toward uh, LGBT um, people. And uh, it ranges from one, uh, a, a low uh, point of, of starting at denial, right? So people will say, Oh, we, those people don't exist, or you know, they don't live around here. We don't have those people come, that come into our mental health facility, or you know, there's a sort of perception that they're not visible, so they don't exist. So that's denial, right? We don't have those people who are around us or live live near us. And then there's repulsion, right? There's people who will then acknowledge that certainly they have people who live around them, but they may have a uh, really negative visceral reaction, right, to those people. They may be repulsed by them, right? And so there's a stigma. Um, people have a major bias against a certain group where they actually almost feel ill, uh, for example, around them. So that is a definitely bad reaction that um, people can have if they don't understand popu other population groups or if they have fear to the point where it makes them you know, ill. Then there's pity. Uh, where there's a, 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 it's just a little bit better than feeling ill. There's pity uh, saying, you know, I feel sorry for those people and, you know, they have such terrible lives or something like that. That's another negative reaction that people um, can have. And then we reach tolerance, right? There's the live and let live, um, you know, way of, uh, of seeing people. And this is actually, uh, there are lots of wonderful initiatives uh, for tolerance, promoting tolerance. Um, but we see tolerance as a, uh, a point along the way to full equality. Um, and Dorothy Riddle actually, on her scale here, put tolerance at a number four because she was considering that people can uh, basically have the negative components of tolerance where people can say, well, okay, you're over there and I'm, you know, but I don't like you, <laughs> so I'm going to tolerate you, right? So there's the there, it's sort of a live and let live, but there's also a negative um, effect, you know, really not liking the people around them. And then we get to acceptance, and that's right in the middle. 
and then move toward other more supportive reactions to different um, diverse populations, support, admiration, appreciation, nurturance, and then celebration. And that's at the very top of this 10-point uh, scale. And celebration is where you would go to, for example, like a gay pride parade. <laughs> so you're going to join the celebration, right? So the point of looking at a scale like this is that it's not like a light switch, right, for people who learn about other cultures, other, other people, diverse populations. Um, you know, they, it's not going to be like a light switch where there's they go from total denial to, like, showing up at the, the pride parade, right? So there's, that, that is a very extreme shift um, and, and I think a very tall order in terms of expectations for people. So this scale can help to basically explain all of the stages um, that people may be at and how there could be evolution um, of this. And even people who come out, for example, they may internalize all of these feelings and all of these aspects. Um, so it's not just a social, you know, uh, approach from people who are non-LGBT, for example, toward people who are LGBT. It's also people who are living in the experience and having their own coming out process may have to you know, go through uh, one or more of these stages. And just to look at the data on this, you know, I always return to when people have personal reactions and you know, all kinds of different things that creep in, with like biases. I'll, I'll always say, recommend, you know, please let's just look at the data. The data makes it objective. It's not political. It's not, you know, sort of biased. The data are the data. So, for example, the uh, U.S. Census did a wonderful you know, national landscape um, survey in 2010, and the Williams Institute crunched all that wonderful data from the U.S. government. And so they, ha they have all these maps um, available on a state basis and a local regional basis that show the where people are responding as being a same-sex couple, for example, or a same-sex couple raising uh, their own children. And so there's wonderful data. So when people say, well, those, if they're at the very bottom end of that um, Dorothy Riddle scale and they're in that denial stage or that step one, um, one objective way to reach people who are, you know, very much on a, on a polarized um, end of the scale is to just objectively approach them with the data, you know, with the information, uh, you know, that exists. And so that's one approach, right, to sort of overcome denial. Um, so, and I'll hand this back to Kathy. So, so Peter talked about this rejection versus support, and I think that a word that, you know, you might hear is homophobia sometimes, and um, it, this particular you know, the, the, the fear, disgust, anger, discomfort, and aversion that individuals experience in dealing with gay people. This was actually a, um, uh, came out of research that was done back in 1980. So you can see how long people have been looking at this issue, and it can really lead to some quite strong, um, it can be quite strong in certain cultures, and it may lead, uh, as uh, Peter has said, to discrimination and, and bias. And we know that it's reflected in some public policies, this idea of protecting um, our children, and we also know, and research has shown that um, this fear uh, or anger or discomfort um, is also among uh, our helping professionals and in the service profession as well. So it's something that we really have to uh, talk about because health systems or behavior health systems that are intending to successfully serve LGBTQ youth and young adults really need to begin to proactively identify places where this kind of rejection um, takes place so that you can figure out the strategies you need to counter it. And that's what we want to um, kind of switch gears to talk about. Um, OK, this, oh, there we go. Um, it, you know, how, how do we counter these effects? And you know, the timeline that we showed you earlier really shows some of the depth and breadth of the bias and the discrimination, uh, the harassment against LGBT people in the country. Uh, and y young adults who are growing up in that kind of social context. So, you know, and, and members of this minority population, they really do face documented socioeconomic and health challenges um, that exceed those of uh, people who don't identify as LGBT. And the best way to address those disproportionate challenges and effectively meet the behavioral health needs is to develop sensitive, supportive, effective care uh, where cultural competence is a foundational value. And there are several specific problem areas 
that behavioral health systems can effectively address. Um, so we're going to take a look at uh, a few of the research findings that can lead to some supportive strategies. Um, so what does the research say? Well, first we know that positive social relationships can provide affirmation and support, and they can counter the negative effects of stress for youth and young adults who are LGBT. We know that um, affirming faith experiences can decrease the degree to which youth and young adults um, who are LGBTQ internalize all of the negativity that they experience, you know, while building spirituality and psychological, psychological good health. Um, we also know that uh, from some of uh, Caitlin Ryan's um, groundbreaking research that we'll talk about a little bit later as well, um, that family affirmation and acceptance, uh, even just a little bit of acceptance um, and less rejecting, is strongly correlated with better long-term health and well-being outcomes uh, and comfort and resilience later in life. So these are all things that our behavioral health system, and especially systems of care and um, family organizations, can pay attention to and can build upon. Um, so all of you are probably familiar with, you know, the system of care is, you know, first and foremost, this network um, of individual service components, you know, with infrastructures and processes. It's a philosophy about how communities should deliver services. Um, and, you know, it really does provide this, provide this framework uh, and a set of values providing mental health services. And so what we want to do is make sure that reflecting in this value system, um, it's imperative to kind of serve these LGBT youth and their families, as well as youth who are questioning their gender or sexual identity. So really taking a look at that framework and where are the places that we can make the changes. Um, so I wanted to ask a question, another take a poll question. Um, how many of you are living or working in communities that have active um, sexual orientation or gender identity expression or LGBT organization services or activities? How many of you are living in those? Do you live or work in a community that has um, active LGBT organizations, services, or activities? Okay, we have a pretty good idea. Um, most of you, 70% uh, are living in communities that have access to active organizations and know about them. Um, a number of you are unsure about them. And then um, uh, eight or nine percent of you have said that, you know, no, there's nothing available for us here. So hopefully we're going to address some of those um, issues and answer some of the questions that you might have for those of you that are not in communities um, either you're aware of that have organizations or um, that know that you do not have organizations. So uh, we can go ahead and back to the other slide. OK, thank you. So, um, so here's, here's what we're looking at then in terms of um, the data of how our youth are doing in our system. So the data shows a disproportionate number of youth who are LGBTQ who are in out-of-home care or homeless. Approximately 13% of youth in detention facilities identify as LGBT, and between 20% to 40% of homeless youth identify um, as LGBT, and there are estimates of between 20% to 60% of youth in child welfare who identify as LGBT. We also know that youth and young adults who are LGBTQ uh, that experience bias and rejection when compared with their heterosexual youth are subject to higher rates of abuse, homelessness, um, due to running away from home or being kicked out, uh, substance abuse, self-harm, suicide attempts. Uh, youth who are LGBTQ report higher levels of harassment, victimization of violence, verbal, physical, and sexual abuse, you know, which are related to increased mental health challenges, 
substance use and sexual risk taking. Um, large majority of the students who are sexually and gender minorities report hearing anti-gay remarks and experience harassment or assault at school because of their sexual orientation and their gender expression. These experiences are associated with higher levels of depression, with lower levels of academic achievement, and with dropping out of school. So you can see why system collaboration, um, such as partnering with schools, is an important component in the system of care. Um, you know, we talk a lot about family partnership and system of care. And this is another foundation um, that's so important. And I mentioned that in uh, Caitlin Ryan's groundbreaking study where she looked at family rejection overall. Um, they found that the LGBT youth and young adults from families that highly rejected their sexual orientation during adolescence compared with peers from families that reported no or low levels of family rejection were eight times more likely to have attempted suicide. They were nearly six times more likely to report high levels of depression. They were three times more likely to use illegal drugs and three times more likely to report having engaged in unprotected sexual intercourse, of course, which puts them at high risk for HIV and other um, sexually transmitted diseases. And we mentioned um, you know, not only is this groundbreaking research, but I know that Melissa is going to be talking about um, a workshop that, we'll, uh, that Caitlin will be doing for the Techno Assistance Network uh, in the very near future. We, um, we know that also there are affirming practices. You know, and a lot of our affirming practices are so embedded in the uh, system of care approach. And you know, system of care recognizes the importance of not only a culturally competent approach, but also a strength-based approach to care, um, an approach that supports affirmative practices. And this means valuing and supporting a youth who is sexually and gender diverse and recognize anti-gay discrimination and the consequences of anti-gay discrimination. Uh, also, affirming practices practices support the youth identity development process. Um, many exemplary graduate programs address this practice model in their multicultural counseling classes. And others incorporate these and related topics throughout curriculum. So we know that we have to get this message into the curriculums of our schools as well, into our um, colleges and universities and other institutions of higher learning. Um, External training is often necessary to increase the knowledge base of clinicians providing services to LGBT individuals. And researchers have also identified 14 themes of um, exemplary practices. And we gave you the website there for that. And includes therapist awareness of homophobia and how it may impact the client's presenting problems. Uh, Peter's going to be reviewing some of those practices later on as well. and. Um, this is one of the, a, a great resource that's out there. Some great resources are out there now, including this one that was released in 2011 um, by the Joint Commission. And this field guide is on LGBT patient-centered care. Uh, it's called the Advancing Effective Communication, Cultural Competence in Patient and Family-Centered Care for the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community. And it really urges US hospitals to create a more welcoming, safe, and inclusive environment for LGBT patients and their families. And the Joint Commission is it's the nation's largest accrediting organization for healthcare facilities. You know, it's responsible for accrediting and certifying more than 19,000 uh, healthcare organizations and programs in the US. And that's available as well. So we wanted to just make sure that we gave you some other resources. I wanted to just show you, too, some of you may have seen this. But um, or let me ask you this question. Um, how many of you have been part of a wraparound team or other multi-agency team that has included strategies to address issues around uh, a youth you know, who may identify as LGBT or Q.
Okay, so we can see that it's really, you know, 45.4% uh, said yes, they have been part of a multi-agency team uh, or wraparound team that has included some strategies to address LGBT issues, and 54.5% have said no. And um, this is one of those ones where I wish we had more time because I'd love to discuss, the, you know, kind of the reasons around this um, in terms of is it because it hasn't come up? Is it because the youth hasn't disclosed? Is it because there aren't resources out there or strategies out there um, or people aren't feeling comfortable? There's all kinds of reasons why um, you may not see that. But what I wanted to show you was something that we've shared uh, in some other wraparound trainings that have been done in this example of a youth wraparound plan where they actually address it. Um, and because for this particular youth, um, <laughs> You know, it, it's around cultural and linguistic competence, but it needs to be operationalized. So when you look at the strengths, traditions, culture, and history, and development strategies, so here's this, um, here's this partial plan of a partial wraparound plan for John, who identifies as a gay male. And what you're seeing here is the um, vision, culture, strengths, needs, and strategies. So not everything is shown. But, you know, if you take a moment to read through this plan, it was something that um, the, the, that John's mother and John had identified um, as being important to them. So you can see that, you know, they're talking about um, Ed, who was the school guidance counselor. Um, he is, he, he, Ed is sponsored for the school's Gay Straight Alliance Club, so he's committed to ending bullying and knows from his experience what bullying was like. Um, so he is part of, you know, the cult, he's part of the strength that they have. Um, Claire has strong roots in her church and community. Uh, she could see that she leads on fellow members for strength. You know, she's involved. Claire is, is John's mother. She's involved in, um, you know, a lot of other things. There's a probation officer that was involved in this and lived in the same community for years. So, you know, we know that there's a lot of um, strengths, and they included the Gay Straight Alliance Club as one of the strengths for this particular use. If we look some more at this wraparound plan, um, you know, some of John's needs was that he needs to know that he can be himself and make friends he can trust. Um, he needs to know that, you know, there's life after high school because high school was very difficult for John and he was being bullied a lot. He was not happy there. He couldn't wait to get out. Um, he needs to know that being gay is okay. Um, his mom, you know, his mother, Claire, she needed to feel that, you know, she's taught her son family values. Um, and needed to know that she can have some of the things that she dreamed of, and also needs to know that for many, many families, it's about you know their child being safe, uh, that John can be safe. And so you can see that some of the strategies um, around this wraparound plan were um, about you know the, we're working with the school, um, we're you know volunteering at runaway shelters, were talking, you know, uh, John's mother was going to talk to the pastor at church about how they can support John, so there were a number of things. So, you know, we can't show you the entire plan, but we really wanted to um, make sure that you knew that within a wraparound plan that it can be addressed. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter because one of the things that this plan assumes is that, that John is actually out, that he is identified as a gay youth. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter to talk a little bit about coming out. Sure. So we talked about coming out earlier and that, that, that concept as a process. And research studies have shown the average age that youth come out is 16. And that is a moving target. We've been seeing uh, younger generations uh, of, of youth who are uh, becoming much more visible. For example, it used to be unheard of that we would see middle schoolers right, coming out, being openly out in middle school. So there's a younger age range that is uh, sort of decreasing the um, studies that have, have kind of been catching up with that average age of, of coming out. Typically it's 16, but there's, you know, there we have seen it much younger, uh, for example, 14 and, 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 and onward. And it can be frightening, difficulty, and risky, right, especially younger ages, um, you know, having uh, less experience in, in, in certain environments, for example. Uh, and there are not only negatives, right, from the considerations for risks and you know, issues that people may run into, um, 
but there are also definitely positive benefits. It can help to create a support system. It can help with a sense of belonging. And it can help many to feel a sense of pride and understanding of who they are. So there are definitely uh, consideration points for you know, how, what, what people are wrestling with, right, in terms of being visible or self-identifying and um, disclosing, you know, what, how they are uh, self-identifying. Um, so they're continually wrestling with the negatives, the risks, as well as the positives. So it is definitely a process. And this is a, you know, celebration, as we mentioned, at the sort of end of the scale of, um, of support and um, self-realization. There are competencies, as you also addressed, for counseling uh, youth who are part of this population. Um, and this includes attitudes and knowledge. And on the attitude side, in terms of competencies, we want to uh, ensure that people are acknowledging that um, this population exists, right, uh, whether they've disclosed or not, uh, to recognize poss the possible impact of um, at someone's own attitudes, values, and beliefs, um, particularly if there are biases involved and how that can affect client care and treatment. Um, we want to definitely look at willingness to explore attitudes, values, beliefs, or bias, right? We are all evolving and learning as human beings. So, you know, this is a willingness to explore is, uh, is a positive aspect of, of that, of understanding diverse population groups. And to also understand uh, someone's own view of, of identity and orientation and its impact on their practices. Again, it's it's how this engagement or interaction, uh, those are the types of attitudinal things that we would, we would want to look at. In terms of knowledge, we know we would like for people to have a, uh, an appreciation of the unique needs and challenges um, faced by this population, uh, particularly among youth, uh, to know that uh, LGBTQ identity is not the same as pathology, which uh, may or may not be related, um, understand how there's dominant heterosexism that Kathy talked about earlier, that impacts uh, youth in particular. I mean, they're um, seeing signals of rejection uh, around them, um, and that can lead to negative things. To understand interactions of sexuality, sexual orientation, and gender identity, right? These are distinct concepts, but there are also interactions. And to understand that children in care um, may have LGBT parents, for example, there is an assumption um, that right, none of the sort of youth that are served um, may have LGBT parents. So there are skills, right, and there's the sort of do's and don'ts and things that uh, we see are common in the field to, uh, to try to not uh, try to change youth, right, or use reparative care approaches. This is a, um, it was called a therapeutic approach uh, incorrectly, and it has been um, definitely rejected from the pantheon of, um, of expertise that uh, reparative therapy is harmful um, to uh, this population. You, know, you can't change people's sexual orientation uh, or gender expression or gender identity. Um, there's an ability to discuss diversity and all LGBTQ issues with young people. We would hope that for people to have that, that type of skill. Um, the ability to identify and use strengths and to value diversity, to intervene uh, with the family sort of where they are, right, to understand the context that their, um, their lived experience is uh, leading that conversation to. The, we want people to have the ability to train others and counter misinformation as well as discrimination, um, to use inclusive, gender neutral, and affirming languages, uh, to protect the safety of youth, certainly, who are part of this population, uh, and to ameliorate or reduce risks, uh, support and advocate for youth who are part of this population as well as colleagues, include youth who are part of this population in programming and policy, and this is definitely resonant with the system of care values and principles um, for um, youth-driven and family-guided care uh, to help agencies shape policy to be non-discriminatory and affirming as well. And particularly for among transgender youth and young adults, we want an understanding that transgender youth face bias and harassment similar to, if not worse than others in the uh, other part of the um, LGB plus acronym. Um, our care systems are often very inhospitable to these youth. Um, that is definitely a population uh, with lots of um, different um, needs and their own uh, particularly uh, you know, need for help in certain areas. 
Uh, just as there's much diversity in the LGBTQI2S community, the T of this part of this population includes very different diverse people. And so uh, we are very much um, continually um, focusing on uh, the needs of transgender populations to um, be allies for them. Uh, there's therapeutic work with transgender youth. Um, there are tips and sort of approaches that are suggested, um, for example, to acknowledge that transgender youth exist and have distinct needs, address discrimination, attend to their non-behavioral health needs, such as safe housing, uh, assist families in creating safe environments for them to express themselves, seek specialized help to provide assistance, train all providers on the needs of transgender youth, for example, and work with them sh uh, should also aim at building their resilience as well as their assets. And we would love for facilities to be inclusive and safe, right? We want safe people to be safe in where there are shared facilities and uh, different places that people interact, right? And so there has been a, um, let's say, a friction point uh, between different policies, anti-discrimination policies and ordinances uh, across the United States. And so there may be a federal law which is conflicting with the state policy, for example, which is conflicting with the county policy, et cetera, maybe different even versions of the same types of, um, sort of legal anti-discrimination protections that, that the wording is different, for example. It may not be that they're totally, you know, contra-opposing one another, um, but there are variations in policies we see all across the U.S. And so one of these areas is, uh, we, for example, we see this in the uh, restroom-related, uh, the bathroom-related uh, um, anti-discrimination policies. There's much discussion, uh, shall we say, around these policies and uh, you know how they're being refined. Um, so we want, at the end of the day, right, we take the politics out of the issue when we, what we want in a bipartisan uh, approach is for all people to be safe, right, regardless of the environment that they're in. So that should be the underlying um, sort of principle, I think. And at the end of the day, we don't care which restroom you use, for example. Uh, we just want people to wash their hands. Uh, that would be a nice, <laughs> a nice common approach as well. So we want to have safe zones and safe spaces for all consumers, right, for people with different racial, ethnic backgrounds, LGBTQI2S uh, consumers. And so safe zones are where places are designated um, as being a safe zone. Uh, they can be things like meeting rooms or common areas. It could be the entrance of a mental health facility or a waiting room, for example, or even on people's uh, office doors, right? If there are individual allies that want to designate that their office is a safe zone, well, what a wonderful thing uh, when engaging and you know, it's, it's showing a welcoming environment for uh, consumers. And then so when we have safe zones and safe spaces, we want to support the individual personnel, our champions, who self-identify as allies and, and to help them to promote their safe zones. Um, so an ally is uh, somebody who supports diversity and inclusion, who stands up right, for minorities to, to receive equal treatment and equal rights. So this is someone who is, uh, you know, is a champion, is somebody who challenges harassment, bullying, discrimination, like sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and other forms these anti-other perspectives. Um, and some people may not say, I'm an ally, right? I'm an ally for this population. Right? They may not self-identify that way. They may say, well, those are my friends, right? Or they may be a supporter in other ways and have different words or terms, but that they are certainly an ally. Um, and so when we look at safe zones, we see many colorful, wonderful examples uh, across the United States, uh, different symbols and colors and uh, even if you know people don't have the sort of colorful version, the top right of this slide shows uh, an example of something that I've uh, seen used uh, that basically has a statement, just a written statement um, without pictures and, and colors. Uh, it says, this space respects all aspects of people, including race, ethnicity, gender expression, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, age, religion, and ability. It's like, wow, this is a, that sounds like a really safe space and one that I would you know, want to be in. So that's a welcoming way of having a, want some signage. And here are other ex additional examples. Um, the one on the right is the entrance to a um, community mental health center and 
Uh, I'm sort of in the shadow taking <laughs> taking the picture in the bathroom in there in the picture. On the left is in uh, in Spanish, and on the right is uh, English. Uh, so there are two versions. Here's an example of a um, therapist who uh, I work closely with in uh, Mississippi. Um, she has a, a safe zone sign uh, right when you walk into her um, into her office to, to talk and um, connect. So it's just a great, um, it's a doable, um, feasible uh, thing that can be done uh, very quickly and easily. Um, you know, should people be interested um, in pursuing that and uh, identifying that there are safe zones um, on their facilities um, spaces. And then I just wanted to talk quickly about trauma-informed approaches. Um, so when we, SAMHSA is very uh, much a champion of trauma-informed uh, practices, and uh, there are many guidelines and resources that SAMHSA provides that are available and they're all wonderful. Um, and so a common approach is to use inclusive language, um, to be aware of assumptions, to know there is a difference between sexual behaviors versus sexual orientation. Uh, so this is an awareness perspective. Um, and so same-sex adolescent exploration, for example, may not equate to orientation. Uh, they may not check a box, right, of how they're uh, how specifically identifying. So there are differences in how um, people will uh, self-identify. And to connect youth with opportunities to interact with peers or other social supports, and which can counter feelings of alienation and isolation. So these are, are approaches to um, uh, that are common and, and are apl applicable to the um, LGBTQI2S population. We want people to learn as much as possible about the development of gender identity and sexual expression, um, use that knowledge to educate youth and families, uh, make the therapeutic relationship a safe space or safe place, and not to expect or pressure youth who are part of this um, population to come out um, to you or to others. I'll hand it back to Kathy. Uh, okay, we just really wanted to mention this, uh, the term, because you may hear the term intersectionality, and I, I'll have to be honest, some people like it and some people don't like the term, um, but what it refers to is youth and young adults who are LGBTQ, um, you know, which is already a known minority group who are also members of other minority groups. They may be ethnic, racial, um, cultural minority groups, religious in nature. And when a person is also in another cultural or minority group, the values and traditions of those other groups may complicate some of the developmental processes, some of the ongoing relationships, um, you know, and, and especially maybe the coming out process. Um, most minority cultural groups have their own norms and expectations for behaviors, including those around gender expression and sexual orientation, and it may be different than the majority culture. Um, and I think what's really nice is that um, uh, Caitlin Ryan and her family acceptance project, they really uh, talk a lot um, about, uh, you know, religions and, and, and the, re the religious kind of um, attitude towards the LGBT. She worked a lot with um, the Mormons. She worked a lot with the Catholic uh, population, and she's put out a couple of publications, and so she'll be talking a lot about that at, at the upcoming workshop in April. Um, but system helpers really have to be prepared uh, and willing to explore some of the complexities, you know, with the youth and their family, trying to help them understand how all these different norms and um, intersecting cultures interact and you know, how, how it can you know, affect them. Um, this dual minority status and stigma it can really create an even greater risk for substance use, violence, risky sexual behaviors. You know, for example, uh, we know that um, uh, LGBTQ Native Americans have increased risk of substance use um, and abuse, mental illness, uh, HIV infection, you know, due to some of the racial ethnic discrimination and to some of the homophobia within some of the Native cultures. And about 46% of LGBTQ youth of color um, report experiencing physical violence related to their sexual orientation. Um, you know, people of color may not identify as gay which may mean that they'll not seek services or hear messages that are designed for maybe the um, white or majority LGBT community. You know, for example, in one study, um, Latino men should higher rates of depression and suicidal ideation. Um, also, LGBTQ people of color may not receive their community support uh, regarding sexual orientation or transgender identity. Um, for example, like Asian Americans and Pacific Islander youth um, who identify as LGBT often feel that they have shamed their families, 
uh, when they diverge from cultural expectations, you know. Um, African American LGBT youth have reported feeling rejected by both you know, the white gay communities and by um, black communities who may be um, less accepting. So just uh, something to, to think about in terms of the intersectionality and, the, um, and, and then really the, the, uh, we want you to think about, you know, imagine that a friend of yours, you know, who's a parent of a young child, five or six years old, and, you know, has a conversation with you that begins with, you know, my son or my daughter is not behaving normally. Um, you know, the, this parent then expresses to you concerns that their little boy is, you know, maybe behaving like a little girl or their little girl is acting just like a, a boy. Um, and they, you know, they go on to tell you that they've been trying really hard to break that behavior, you know, that they've either begun punishing their child by sending them to their room for time out, um, you know, when the behavior is not close enough to what the parent expects for that child's gender. You know, we just want you to think about, you know, what you might say to that parent, you know, after they've shared that information with you or, you know, what, what kind of questions do you ask the parents to better understand their reaction and um, what is it, you know, just, you know, we know that this happens. We know that these kind of conversations go on um, within our families, amongst our families and amongst our friends. So really in summary, um, we, you know, if we know what we need to do, and if we focus on what we need to do, and if we do what we need to do, um, the bias, the discrimination, the rejection, the lack of support you know, given to sexual and gender minorities in our country means that we can deliberately counter kind of the absence of the support who, um, that's experienced by many of our youth and young adults. Um, and this harassment and rejection can occur in helping systems. It can occur in families and communities and faith-based systems. Um, and what we need to do to counter these problems uh, is educate communities about this population. Uh, it's about you know, recruiting and supporting LGBTQ role models from the community to serve as mentors uh, and informal supports to young people, develop peer support opportunities among young and young adults who are um, LGBTQ. And um, you know, just know that we need to continue to do the research on it and understand how to achieve some positive outcomes. Um, and I think one of the things that we need to really focus on in terms of the research priorities is the data collection piece. So I've asked Peter just to talk uh, just for two minutes about um, the issue around data collection because it's such an important part of this and it's something that I think family organizations can really have an impact on in terms of advocating for. Peter? Yeah, uh, I can talk all day about um, data. So uh, I'll, I'll I know you can. <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> uh, so when we look at data collection, we want to definitely encourage everyone to update their forms um, to uh, the modern era of uh, where we are in, in uh, 2017. Um, we are very much finding that um, LGBT inclusive data are not uh, a common thing still uh, to this day. Um, and in terms of a quality improvement or in data and evaluation uh, approach, if you don't have the data, right, the, the demographics, then you can't make comparisons and you don't have the ability to look at disparities. Um, and you also can't improve what you don't measure, right? So you, there's no way to establish a baseline, for example, for consumers and, and you know, and how they're doing in treatment because, you know, to, to be able to analyze if you, whether the, you're able to move the needle, for example, from one point to the next and um, follow up. Um, and the transgender people in particular uh, find themselves invisible, right? They're not, they're, they don't exist on forms. Um, and so, for example, you may see a common checkbox for male and a checkbox or check line for female, um, but transgender people are not, they don't exist, right, in that. Um, and so when we say we'll update the forms, Many times we'll hear, well, we're not sure how to ask the question. Well, there are uh, many, many examples, um, and here is just one of uh, how to ask right, about sexual orientation, just along with other demographic um, variables. And so uh, when we talk about gender identity, the guidance from this uh, national group is to uh, have the two-step question, uh, what sex were you assigned at birth and your original birth certificate? And then how do you describe your gender identity now? And right, so then that way you can uh, make a comparison and, and, and look at transgender um, identity. 
and so when we ask about um, specific questions for people to self-identify, um, there are concerns that are raised, right, that from personnel, um, individual staff, uh, from administrators uh, about um, whether or not it's going to sort of lead to harm, right, it's going to be a negative in some way. And so there's concern about avoiding uh, inclusive data collection because it's sort of seen as easier or you know, something that um, is going to really uh, make people uncomfortable in some way or have some kind of negative reaction. Those are all assumptions um, that we have heard about that really don't bear out in practice. Um, that is not something we see in the field. Uh, if it's uh, bracketed correctly or introduced correctly, right, we're not going to dump cold forms on the people that have just been updated and not explained you know, to staff that there's been an update or, you know, that you appreciate why it's important to collect, you know, inclusive uh, demographic information. And then for consumers, there's this um, consideration that it's going to make them uncomfortable, and that's a projection, right? It's a sort of fear that um, doesn't really pan out. And so the approach here is to always, in any data collection, is to say, you know, the following questions help us to better understand the diversity of the consumers we serve so that we can improve service quality, right? And so if that's, that's the sort of essence of the explanation of why it's important to uh, personnel as well as consumers to understand the intent of data collection, it's definitely not a negative. It's something to improve quality. That's how I think, you know, it's, that's the approach that we want to have on whether you're asking about LGBTQ or race or ethnicity or age or any type of, um, you know, demographic um, specific question. Um, and then we want to provide training and support for working with diverse populations, again, to support staff um, so that we're not just kind of, you know, expecting something from a top-down perspective. So, Kathy, I'll hand it back to you to close this out. Uh, really, that's, that's about all that we can cover in this pre presentation. And again, we just really thank you for uh, inviting us to share this information with you. And, you know, we've included some of the resources, we've, additional resources that we have here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to back to Melissa and to Barbara. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Kathy and Peter. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. And thank you for providing so much um, valuable information and, and um, input. Um, I found it to be extremely beneficial and learned a lot. So um, we have um, about 10 minutes or so um, that we can have questions um, for Kathy and Peter um, around this topic of um, understanding um, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Um, so if anyone has a question um, and would like to, uh, for Kathy or Peter, please type it into the chat box. And as those questions come in, we will pose those to Kathy and Peter and they um, can respond. Um, just to get us started, um, I had a question that I wanted to pose to you guys. Um, as previous, earlier in the presentation, you had mentioned that you're starting to see um, young people um, coming out earlier and earlier at earlier ages. Um, and, you know, I, having some teenage boys myself, um, I wondered if you are seeing or hearing that um, children and youth um, are, are more supportive or accepting of their LGBTQ peers in a school setting, and whether or not you think that has anything to do with um, the fact that, that young people are coming out early, at an earlier age. Um, I can, I, I can, go ahead, Peter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to just offer the Pew Research Center does uh, phenomenal attitudinal surveys that, uh, particularly for race and ethnicity, uh, for multiracial dating and acceptance of, of diverse people um, dating one another or um, you know becoming married, for example. Um, and it sh they break that down by age group, um, by decade. And what it, that shows, particularly on the racial um, integration uh, perspective, is that youth now, millennials in particular, uh, it's very normal for them to have a very diverse uh, friends by race and ethnicity. And there are other studies that complement 
um, the attitudinal change, um, there's GLSEN's research and school climate survey data that shows that the acceptance, as you've indicated, is, is much greater, the visibility among younger age groups, um, particularly middle school and high, you know, uh, beginning of high school, uh, that we are seeing definite trends where people are coming out um, at younger, younger ages um, because there is a more accepting environment uh, among the younger uh, age groups. Yeah, I was going to add that too, that some of the research that's out there, it's been interesting um, because when you ask, you know, the youth and some of the millennials and the even younger youth about um, how they, um, you know, how they describe their, their um, gender or sexual orientation, I mean, they are really using some terminology that we can't even keep up with, um, you know, about being on that spectrum and, and not identifying it as either male or female or gay or straight. Um, but just a very fluid, you know, way of being in this world. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm going to send the research out to, to the, some of the research findings out to you because I remember doing a presentation and talking about these specific numbers, and it was astounding um, how many youth identify as, you know, kind of on this gender fluid scale now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of that has to do with uh, a lot of that has to do with um, the accepting you know, of greater acceptance. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I, I had a, you know, had a sense that, you know, just from my own sphere of, of um, being a parent of a person um, in um, high school and, and having um, a lot of his friends around, it, there, there seems to be a sense that it, it, it just isn't as much of an issue. It's not as noticeable. It's not something they focus on. It's, there seems to be, as you've indicated with the research, a much more accepting, much more um, welcoming and, and um, accepting environment. Um, in the schools around this issue. And um, again, um, you know, we could learn a lot from paying attention to our, our young people and, and the guidance they could right. give us around this issue, clearly. Right. Um, we have another question. Um, has research shown any differences between rural and metropolitan or suburban LGBT youth? <clears throat> Sandy, you got that one? I, I, I actually don't have um, I don't have the answer to that. I think a lot of the um, a lot of the answer to that is um, is more anecdotal. I mean, what we hear from uh, you know youth that live in rural communities is that they don't have access to a lot of services. That there aren't a lot of um, they don't feel safe coming out in certain places um, that are more rural. Um, and that there are, you know, in metropolitan areas, there's, there, you're more apt to find community centers, you're more apt to find uh, community, you know, like-minded communities that are going to be accepting. Um, but in terms of the research piece, I don't, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but we can certainly do some, some digging to look that up to see if there are any. Um, it, it's yeah, and, you know, and then, more so than the anecdotal. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, and I can, I can speak to the evaluation piece because I, I work with so many systems of care. Um, I'm a program evaluator of um, five systems of care directly and then I work you know, nationally to help um, with technical assistance and, and c connected to many uh, information channels um, with the system of care network across the U.S., particularly in the southeast. Um, and so we do find in, in rural areas um, you know, let's say typified um, rejection-related uh, um, concerns uh, where people are targeted for violence, for example, or that there's, there are hostile environments, um, places where youth are, you know, kicked out and become homeless. And so rural areas definitely have um, a unique set of resource challenges and transportation um, challenges are very common among rural areas. Um, and so the just, it is a definite um, need for, uh, and I think it speaks even more volumes more so that systems of care need to really have that cross-system integrated approach um, to interconnect all of those resources that surround youth um, from, you know, every aspect of um, health and human services, uh, particularly in rural areas because of those challenges 
Uh, we really want a, a, a safe zones um, expanded in rural areas um, because we know the needs are so great um, and, and there, there are definite um, aspects and considerations for, for the challenges, unique challenges that rural areas face. Okay. Um, we have another question that's come in. Um, someone indicated that their organization is having a person who is transgendered present a segment on sex, sexuality, and gender. Um, the question was, should adults and youth participate in a session like this together, or do you advise um, having separate sessions for families and youth? Um, well, I mean, I think that it all depends on what the goal of the session is. Uh, you know, what, what, the, what is it that you're trying to get out of that particular session? You know, in systems of care, you know that you know we we really do believe in youth voice um, and want to hear from our youth. I think there are times when um, you know youth want to have a space of their own to talk about things, and I think there are times when family members want you know want to have a space of their own. There are times when the clinicians want to have a space of their own, and then there are times when it's really important that everybody um, get together and be able to you know uh, talk with each other. So I I, I think the answer is, is, you know, a little bit, it's a little bit more complicated than just, you know, should you have a separate space? It's like, what's the actual goal um, of that session, you know? Um, do you want people right. to understand what it's like to be uh, a transgender youth, you know, and then, and then nothing speaks to that as well as a youth who's actually, you know, going through it or has lived through it or a family member that has lived through it. So, I don't know, okay. Peter, if you had something else or, or... Uh, yeah. It's perfect, Kathy. It's exactly. I totally agree. Okay. Well, before we um, wrap up, um, we want to share with um, you guys um, that are left on the call a few things. Um, one is a recent publication that Fredla developed called the Lead, um, Lead Family Contact Tip Sheet. Um, this is a tip sheet. The link is on the slide in front of you, but you can also access it through the Fredla website for download. Um, and it was developed um, for communities and systems of care who are looking to hire a family member um, to help infuse family voice, involvement, leadership, and family-driven care throughout their systems and communities. It provides some templates and some qualifications to consider um, and different ways that family members can be employed. So that's something we wanted to make sure folks were aware of. Um, we also want to make sure that folks on the call are aware that there is a survey that just went out today um, that we're, we're starting to do, um, and it's a national family-run organization survey, and we're really looking to gather a national picture um, around the impact that family-run organizations are having on children, youth, and families, as well as their role in shaping services and systems. So if you're someone who is not on our listserv, um, but works within a family-run organization and would like to make sure you um, are able to participate in that survey, um, you can email us at info at fredla.org, um, and we can get that survey directly to you. Um, another uh, piece that we want to um, share with you guys on the call, um, very relevant to this topic, is a training uh, meeting that is happening um, April 25th and 26th in Detroit, Michigan. And Caitlin Ryan's Family Acceptance Project was mentioned um, by Kathy a few times in the presentation. And Caitlin Ryan is going to be coming in to do a two-day um, training. Um, this training is for family leaders, parent peer support providers, leadership staff of family-run organizations, it's also for project directors, wraparound coordinators, and clinicians um, who work with young people um, who identify as LGBTQ. Um, the first day is really going to be focused on Caitlin's Family Acceptance Project um, and the approach um, to how um, families using an acceptance um, approach with their children, um, as Kathy mentioned, produce much better outcomes um, both in the short term and the long term um, for those young people. The second day is going to be reserved exclusively for family leaders and leadership staff of family-run organizations to spend some time exploring how these kinds of approaches and this kind of work and outreach can be interwoven throughout the work that family-run organizations do. 
um, as many of you on the call connected to family organizations know, we're all working and touching the lives of families who have young people um, that are represented on this gender spectrum. Um, but I think there's probably a lot we could be doing to be much more informed and aware of how to best support these families and young people and how to do more comprehensive outreach to ensure that these young people and families are connected with the kinds of supports and services that they need to be successful. So um, if this is something that is of interest to you and you'd like to participate in, the link to register is on this slide. Um, space is limited, so we're encouraging people to register as soon as possible. Um, and lastly, I want to remind people that the next learning community call is scheduled for March 23rd, and we will be spending our time during that call um, looking at the important role family members play in transition of youth and young adults with behavioral health needs. Um, and I want to thank our presenters, Kathy Lazier and Peter Gamash, and our guest facilitator, Barbara Huff. Um, you've all given us some exceptionally um, valuable information and a lot to think about in our work with children, youth, and families. We hope that all of you who've joined us um, have learned a lot and um, will join us in thanking our presenters. And with that, I will wrap it up.